Hey, good morning, Newport Mesa Church. My name is Pete Campbell. I am one of the associate pastors here. I help with worship and creative arts. And today I have the special opportunity to preach to you you guys today, to talk with you about this message that I really feel God has laid on my heart. And, uh, you know, over these past couple weeks, we've been going through our Thanksgiving series, choosing how to give thanks. And so today I actually want to welcome all of our first-time guests. If you guys are here, thank you so much for being here. For those of you who are watching us online through Facebook Live, We are so glad that you guys are tuning in today, and we pray that this message touches you guys, impacts you today. Um, I want to actually take this moment right now, because we've been doing it these past two weeks, and we've been honoring and giving thanks and gratitude toward those who have been serving, to those who have been answering the call. And so today, I want to thank John and Eileen Huntley. And so here, I want to tell you just a little bit about who John is and, and Eileen. John and Eileen have served the Lord well and have been faithful to the ministries here of Newport Mesa Church for, guess how long? Get ready for this? 59 years. Come on, yeah. And if I can have John come up here too as well, I'd love to see you, my friend. They began attending Newport Mesa Church on Memorial Day weekend in 1960. Now, during the early years at Newport Mesa Christian Center, John coordinated the audiovisual ministry, and his idea was to provide sermons. Come up here, my friend. How are you doing today? Good. Good? I always love John, because every time I see him, I'm like, hey, how are you doing? He says, top of the world. Top of the world. I love this guy. I have, uh, you know, all of the different things that John has done. I, since coming here a little, almost about three months ago, John has been such a huge blessing to me, because in all of the different areas, he has got run with all of these different things as far as creativity, as far as technology. And I love seeing what has done in his life and what he's continuing to do because he's been a blessing to me as well and just coming here on staff. And so John, I wanted to share with you, John coordinated the audiovisual ministry. And so he had this idea to bring sermons on cassette tape. Anybody remember those? Come on, yeah, right? Now, could you imagine for some of those sermons that went long, you, got, you finally had the double side flip where it actually flipped over and just kept going for you, right? John had this idea to put messages on cassette tape, and so he revolutionized the outreach to missionaries around the world because all of those cassette tapes, all of those messages were being sent to bless missionaries who were serving and committing their lives to the gospel. Another cool fact about John is that he has recorded, helped record every single sermon spoken here at Newport Mesa since 1960. Yeah, come on, let's give it up. Now, John's missionary efforts with Vaz Ministries included partnering with Love Lift Ministries to deliver Christmas bags to needy men, women, and children. He accomplished this trip after trip by loading up and driving a motor home across the border. Wow. With the cargo hidden from sight, huh? Some of the other things that he did, he said when they arrived to the remote locations in Mexico to deliver the bags, they would also hold services with video and puppet shows. John also flew his own plane to Mexico, often as a part of a Christian missionary pilot's trip. His efforts resulted in hundreds upon hundreds having needs met and adding countless souls to the kingdom. Eileen and John, they're the unofficial members, uh, historians of Newport Mesa Church, And Eileen was even a tremendous resource for the 75th anniversary of Newport Mesa Church. Eileen has graciously supported John's missionary endeavors. And John and Eileen, who are generous with their time and their resources, one of the things I love the most is they have a servant's heart. You know, I can sit there and we have, I have a weekly meeting with John. He comes into the church and and we we, we chat a little bit and then he always tells me just, well, whatever we need to do, you know, he's like, I'm there, I'll help you. If, if, If he doesn't know the answer to it, guess what? First one who's beating me on Google, this guy, right? I love John, and I love the ministry that him and Eileen have been able to, to, to bestow upon us here at Newport Mesa Church for those who have gone before us and for those who are to come. Because I will tell you this, in the area of technology, in the area of getting these, these messages and all of this content of the gospel being preached, the foundation was laid by this guy. Amen. So John... We want to say thank you. Come on, let's give it up for him. Woo! Amen. So, John, we wanted to give this gift for you and Eileen. 
just to say how much we appreciate you guys and we love you. And thank you so much for continuing to give of yourselves for the cause of Christ. Amen. Let's thank give you. it up for John today. I got you. Amen. Like I said earlier, I am super excited. I don't know if you can tell, but I'm very, very excited about this opportunity to speak with you guys today, to share with you what I feel God has laid upon my heart. And so as we dive into thanks living, this is part three of our Choosing to Give Thanks series, and I've titled this message today, The Gratitude Response. The Gratitude Response. And so what I want to do is I want you guys to turn your attention to the screens. You can go ahead and take a, uh, we'll have the scriptures on there as well. Another thing you guys can do is you can take your notes on the app or you can take your notes on the sheets that have been provided for you guys. But let's go ahead and put this on here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. And this is going to be coming out of the Passion Translation. And it says this, be cheerful. In some translations, it also says rejoice, right? So it says, be cheerful with joyous celebration in every season of life. Let joy, what? Overflow. For you are united with the anointed one. Let gentleness be seen in every relationship, for our Lord is ever near. Don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing, but be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled requests before God with overflowing, what is it? Gratitude. Gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. Verse 7, then it says, Then God's wonderful peace that transcends Human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. So keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind. And fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him always. And then it says, follow the example of all that we have been imparted to you, and the God of peace will be with you in what? All things. All things. Let's pray together today. Dear God, we thank you once again for this moment, for this opportunity to gather together. God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the life that it brings. And so Lord, we ask right now, and it is my heart, God, that you would use me, and that you would open our, our ears to hear, that you would open our minds to receive what you want to share with us today. It's in your precious name we pray, and everybody said, amen. 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 Have you guys ever had plans only to have them go completely wrong? (laughs) Right? Have you ever kind of laid out certain details and and had certain expectations only to have them completely not even work out? Right? Parents, with kids, even with toddlers, teenagers, all those different things. Have you ever had plans only to come to find out that your toddler or your kid decides, I'm not having that, right? Plans can go wrong. We can, we can put things together. We can think about all of the details and say, you know, this is what I'm looking forward to. This is what I want to happen. And then stuff can go completely awry. You know, I, uh, Sarah and I, our family, we were in Indiana for a little over 12 years. And being there in the Midwest, um, first off, we have this thing called winter, which Praise Jesus, we do not have that here. Come on, let's give it up for God for that, right? Dude, some of you guys, I feel like, I don't think you're as appreciative of that gift. I am. (laughs) For those of you who know what I'm talking about, right? So here's the deal. In Indiana, we had, uh, everybody in Indiana loved to go to the woods. They loved to camp. I, I, I am a walking buffet for mosquitoes, and so I try not to do that, but One of the things that everybody loved to do in Indiana was to have campfires, was to have little fire pits. And so everybody would go outside, and they would bring these ingredients together. I want you to imagine this with me, okay? Just think about this. They would bring these ingredients, and and it involved graham crackers. Come on, somebody. You know what I'm talking about, right? Chocolate. Marshmallows. Right. Right. And so here's this thing, marshmallows, s'mores, right? They're, it's an art. To make a s'more, it's an actual art form. Would you agree? Yeah. Now, some of you, you don't appreciate the gift that has been given to you, and you just take those, these marshmallows, this precious gift, and you take it, and you poke it with a stick so violently, you don't even care for it. But what happens? 
We take the marshmallows and then we put it over the fire. For me, it's an art. I like to have it to where it's golden brown. Okay? I think we can just end right now, right? I mean, golden brown, right? Where some of us will take these marshmallows and we will burn them to kingdom come. Did you guys know the studies have proven that the tar and that the char and all that stuff actually really isn't that good for you? Just saying, okay? So anyway, but here's the deal. So some of us would burn the marshmallows to a crisp, and you like it black. So it's like, hey, right? And so for me, I really believe, man, it's an art form. I, I want it to be golden brown, and then I have a process where I, I get one of those skewers. Now they've got the fancy skewers where you actually put the whole thing together and then throw it over the fire. I mean, who, man, I should have thought of that, right? But here's the deal. So I love them golden brown because, man, when I bite into it, it tastes great. There's no burntness, no different things like that. But what I want to tell you is that, you know, we can plan for things to happen in our lives, and then they don't go according as planned. When our marshmallow gets charred and burnt to a crisp, a lot of us, some of us, like me, sometimes will throw the marshmallow away because... It's not good anymore. But did you know that if you actually took a knife or if you took something, you could actually pull that char off and what's underneath it? A creamy marshmallow, right? Think about this for a moment. Isn't that kind of just like life? Sometimes we can get burned. Sometimes things can happen that don't go according to plan. And we feel like the rest of what's to come is really not worth anything. But if we're willing to get a little sticky, if we're willing to get a little messy, we can find out, no, there's still a treasure, there's still a purpose inside. Come on. I know this is, hey, this is 920, but I need you guys to be with me today. I've had my cup of coffee. I've been up and ready to go. All right? See, it's a picture of life. I want you to get this. Life is 10% of what happens and 90% of how we respond. See, today I want to talk to you about the gratitude response. So many of us, so many of us in our life, there will come times where things will get burned and we'll have to come to a point, to a crossroads where we make a decision. What are we going to choose? How are we going to respond? Are you going to look at the surface and feel like, you know what, it's burnt, it's trash, I need to get rid of it? Or are you going to be willing to get deeper into the problem and to see that there's actually a purpose in the pain? There's actually a purpose in the uncertainty. And somehow come to the realization, guess what, that God can still use it. So often we think that life happens to us and then it dictates our future but the truth is how we respond dictates our future and that's what this whole series has been all about how we respond choosing to give thanks in all things choosing to give thanks to god on himself for the temporary things choosing to give god thanks for the eternal things even if we were to have nothing good happen for the rest of our lives can we still give thanks to god pastor jordan talked about that last week what a real message right what a freeing message if you we really understand it if we really capture it if we really grab a hold of it see the number one case or the number one cause of suicide is depression but number 3 on the list comes from the negative event that clouds our perspective. And that brings us to a point where we just don't believe that there's any good to live for. I want you to hear that. So the number one cause for suicide is depression. Right two steps below, number three, comes from the negative event that clouds our perspective. But the reality is this, that events happen to us, but what? We have to respond to it. I want you to think about Peter and Judas for a moment. Two disciples who walked with Jesus. They, they lived with Jesus. They traveled with him. They experienced and saw the same thing, right? For those of us who know about for Peter and Judas. They experienced the same thing. They saw Jesus feed the 5,000. They saw 
Jesus heal a blind man by putting mud in his eyes and saying, now you can see. And him all of a sudden seeing, having his vision. In the book of John, we see that they were there with Jesus when he turned water into wine. They both saw it. They both had a relationship with Jesus. They both were there physically with him. But yet they both failed the same way. You see, Jesus, uh, Judas sells out Jesus for money. Judas approaches Jesus at the garden, and, he, and, and Jesus says, friend, do what you came to do. I want you to catch that concept for a moment. The last words that Judas hears from Jesus is, friend. I don't know about you, but that encourages me that even in my worst moments, even in my worst act, God says he still wants to be my friend. See, Peter commits the same mistake. He denies Jesus to a little girl. Judas betrayed Jesus because he got paid. But what did Peter do? Peter did it because he was afraid. They both failed, but the reactions, right, are quite different. You know, I really believe that there's someone here today that you need to get this in your spirit. You need to hear this and let this resonate in your heart. That an event has happened. And guess what? You may have failed. But I want to let you know this truth today, that failure is not final. It's part of the process. I want you to hear that. Failure is not final. Because why? It's part of the process. You know, for me, I will tell you this. I have been in full-time ministry since uh, 2005. And answering the call of God, and my wife and I, we got married in 2005, and we stepped into youth pastoring, and, and I was doing uh, youth pastoring and worship and all of these different things, and just serving the local church and, and, and pouring into teenagers because I love them so, even though they smell bad at times, right? <laughs> but here's the deal, I, you know, in 2017, my wife and I, we then felt God call us, and we moved to San Diego to, to be a part of a church plant in downtown San Diego. Woo! Okay. And after 18 months, something happened to me that I never would have imagined in my life. Because I love Jesus. I love God. I know that his calling on my life is real. I can't deny it. It's, it's, it's what I think about. It's what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about him, and I'm passionate about seeing people know him. But I will tell you this truth, that 18 months in, I wasn't the same person anymore. 18 months in, I found myself feeling things and wrestling with things and struggling with mental things and depression and all of these different things because I just wasn't in the right place. The hard truth of the reality is, is I was burned out. I had allowed my giftings, I had allowed my work to, to take control and I didn't find time to rest, I didn't find time to to find joy in what God was calling me to do. I didn't find joy in just God himself because the pressures of life were hard because in doing that, that season of ministry, we got burned. You know, life happens. And I will tell you this, at 36 years old, I, when, I, when I realized that and I said, okay, God, I know what we need to do. We need to step out. We need to, we need to quit. We need to resign. And we just need to seek you. I will tell you, in those t three months after I quit, I never had some, I had some dark moments. And I felt like I'd failed. I'd come home. I didn't have a job. Living here in SoCal, you know how that, that doesn't last long. But somehow God had his hand over us. And in that process, man, I, God helped me look at my failure. He helped me look inside of me. And realize a few truths. And realize that, hey, in this moment, I had a choice on how I was going to respond. And how I was going to react. And in that moment, there were certain things that God had brought to my path. Books, people, opportunities, relationships. That helped bring healing. That helped restore things in my heart. But I wrestled with that failure. But then I realized today that it's actually been part of the process. 
It's been part of the process. See, every one of us, I want you to get this today. Some of you are thinking of giving up because you failed. But I want to tell you, there's a bright future ahead. There's a bright future. The joy is not in the successes. It's in the process. It's in trying. See, every one of my successes, I will tell you today, is stacked on lots and lots of my failures. Failure is setting up the story that God is telling. Not about the story that I think needs to be told, but it's about the story that really comes from Him and Him alone. Failure isn't just learning about how to make it work, but guess what? It's learning about why it doesn't work. It's pushing you forward, but you have a choice to make. A right or a wrong response. See, Judas... He stepped away from community, he stepped away from his brothers, and he isolated himself. And we all know what happened, Judas hung himself. But Peter, after he denied Jesus, what did he do? He chose to heal in community. He went back with his disciples. He went back with his friends. See, isolation intensifies the pain, but I want to tell you something, community heals it. That's why we truly believe here at Newport Mesa Church that small groups are the best thing because there is healing that can only come in community. There are things that God will use. There are people that God will put in your life that will help you bring you through the process to see that your failure isn't final, but to show you that God has more purpose in store for your life, but it has to happen through relationship. See, Judas chose a permanent solution to cure a temporary problem. While Peter chose to get into community, he chose to repent, he chose to find healing with Jesus. And we all know what happened with Peter, that God used him to be the leader of the New Testament church. We're talking crazy and psychotic Peter, man. The dude who was so passionate and zealous. I love him. I don't think I'm as crazy as he was, but I try to live up to the name every once in a while. But I want you to think about this for a moment. Peter discovered, he discovered how to respond with gratitude. He discovered how to have the right response. That no matter what happens, he figured out how to respond. How to keep his eyes focused on God alone. See, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10 in the New Living Translation says this, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God. May this be freeing to some of you today, for he cares about you. Verse 8, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Verse 9, it says, stand firm against him. And be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through what? The same kind of suffering? No. Really? Isn't it crazy how the enemy would want you to think that you're all by yourself? Yeah. And then in verse 10 it says, In his kindness God calls you to share it as an eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you suffered a little, after you suffered a little while, Guess what? God will restore. He will support. He will strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. I want you to know this truth today. I want you to know that God is careful about you. He's careful about you. He cares about you. He cares about your dreams. He cares about what you go through. He cares about what you've gone through. And he's never going to drop the ball. Never going to drop the ball. See, in my season, in my process of allowing God to just continue to work in my life, I, I was reading certain books and I came across certain things because I was just, I, I, I was going to God, right? 
I was seeking him. I was spending time with him literally for about a month and a half every single day because I didn't have a job. I wasn't working. I'd take my kids to school, and I would drive out to Mission Beach there in San Diego. I know exactly what street I would always park on right there by Nautical, and I would pull in, find my parking spot so that I didn't get a ticket because the ticket people there in San Diego are crazy, right? <laughs> and I was like, I don't need another ticket. I can't afford one of those. And so I would find a spot. I'd pull my guitar out. I'd get my Bible out. I'd get like two or three books, and I would go to the beach with a chair on my shoulder, and I would sit there literally on the beach all day until it was time to go get my kids from school. And I sought after God, and I read, and I just got my heart right. I restored my first love again. And in some of the books that I was reading, I came across seven things, and I want to share with you this today. As I've been talking about the gratitude response, I'm going to share with you seven things on how to grow in gratitude. See, we have to establish a habit. A lot of us, we, we hate that idea of trying to establish a habit. We hate the idea because why? It requires discipline. It requires having to sacrifice, to actually putting something above yourself, right? But I want, you to, t I want to tell you something today. We've got to establish a habit. If we really truly want to live this life of thanks living, choosing to give thanks, choosing to respond in gratitude, then we've got to develop a habit. What's a habit? Habits are when you don't know what to do, you still know what to do. You're going to act in such a way that will allow your feelings then to actually catch up with where you're at. Because for you, for some of you, I don't know if you're into the Enneagram thing, I am a, I am a number two, I'm a helper, I'm a feeler, I'm all about the relationships, and sometimes that gets the best of me. And so I want to share with you seven things to help us grow in gratitude. The first one is this, three walks. Three walks. Research shows that mental and emotional health is connected to our physical body. So when, we, when you walk, your perspective will start to shift. People who take better care of them possessions rather than their body. I want to tell you something to this. We only get one body, Right? We only get one body. For all of us in this room who have vehicles, we all know that if something's wrong, we better fix it. We all know that after we drive 3,000, some of you 5,000, some of you are like, wait, how many miles do I need for an oil change? Right? We have to do a tune-up every once in a while. Don't you think your body needs one? Don't you think that for some of you who are technology savvy, you've got your newest iPhone every time that it updates? Right? Sometimes your phone starts to get wonky and all these different things and it doesn't work and it's like, oh, maybe I need to update something on my app. I need to update this. We do tune-ups. We, we focus on upgrading things. We focus on making sure things are working, but then we never really do that much care and attention for ourselves. See, three walks. I find now that we live here, we live in Irvine, in a, little, in a community in Irvine, right there by Shady Canyon, and one of the things that I've begun to just love is being able to just walk with my family. Now with daylight savings time, it kind of ruins it a little bit because <laughs> it's already dark and, right? But I found that I love just being able to just walk. Sometimes with my kids, we're just riding bikes. I'm trying to make sure that they don't get hit, right? And... But it's something about those moments. Why? Because we're just spending time. We're just talking. Our perspective changes. We're looking around, seeing other people. We're looking around, just seeing what's around us. And just changing a perspective. And then also doing something that's good just for me. That's good for my body. To walk. To exercise. To, to find things that feed your body and your soul. Three walks. Another thing that I would say, number two, is a 20-minute replay. Somewhere in your day, I want to encourage you to give yourself 20 minutes to reflect. So here's what I mean. I mean, stop what you're doing or plan it out in your day. Some of you, if you're really that down to the details, plan it out. Get quiet and look at everything that's just taking place. 
It's so easy to go, 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 and it ends up magnifying the bad, bad, bad. But if you take time to pause, if you take time to just slow down to reflect, you'll begin to see gratitude and happiness increase in your life. The right reaction and magnifying the good, guess what, will always fuel your soul. Number three, acts of random kindness. Think about when you were the recipient of it. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's this quote that goes like this. It says, until the hand actually gives generously, the heart can't see correctly. There's something attached to you and there's something attached to me when we give, when we serve, and we're loving with no expectation to be noticed or thanked. And it brings satisfaction and fulfillment to your life. Some of us, we want to do something great for God when, when God is just saying, just start doing something. But then we're waiting for the great thing and next thing, guess what? You'll find yourself doing nothing. Romans 2 verse 4 says this, Do the riches of his extraordinary kindness make you take him for granted and despise him? Haven't you experienced how kind and understanding he has been to you? Don't mistake his tolerance for acceptance. Do you realize that all the wealth of his extravagant kindness is meant to melt your heart Woo. and lead you to repentance? See, when we start becoming like Jesus is the moment we start giving without an expectation of return. It shifts the atmosphere. It begins to reach people and show them Jesus who lives in and through us. That's how we grow in gratitude. The next one is a complete unplug. You need to come up with times in your life to completely disconnect with this world, and I will tell you that is very, very, very hard. Social media, our culture, it's got us so focused on everyone else that a lot of times we do have this feeling of FOMO, of missing out, because we want to be a part of something. We want to see what's happening with other people. Sometimes we even live our lives through what's happening in other people. But I want to tell you that anxiety and fear come when you start dwelling on the past and you're afraid of the future. The only way to live in gratitude is to focus on where you are and get engaged at what you're doing. So I want to tell you today and encourage you today, if you want to grow in gratitude, if you want to live this life of thanks living for God, for people, focus on where you're at right here in this very moment on what's happening in your life. Focus on it and get engaged. Get all in. Don't ride the, don't ride the fence. Don't go half-hearted, but go all in and give everything you got, and I will guarantee you that gratitude and everything will follow you because that is God's promise. Someone said that in our culture today, in our society today, that people have lost their wonder. People have lost their wonder. If we don't live a life of awe and wonder, we're going to find ourselves lacking in happiness and gratitude. We need to let wonder capture us again. The wonder of God. The wonder of who He is. The wonder of His creation. The wonder of what He thinks about you and me. Find time to rest. The next one is workflow. There's something special when you live your life with passion. You have to be proactive with your passion. The only way you're going to find your purpose is when you're proactive. People will think that purpose will come looking for you. Isn't that crazy how we sometimes believe that? But I want to tell you that it doesn't. Because we can look in the scriptures, we can see in God's word, for instance, Elisha, he was in the fields plowing, doing the work, and then Elijah comes to him and says, leave everything behind, burn it, and I'm going to give you a purpose. I'm going to give you something to live for. Think about the disciples. 
what were some of them doing? They were fishing on a boat. And Jesus says, hey, guys, what's going on? Hey, I want to let you know something. I'm gonna, I, I don't want you to go fish for fish anymore, but I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to give you a purpose. I'm going to give you a plan and show you something greater to live for. Purpose happens. We find it happening when we give our lives and our energy to it. The next one is this. is just a two-minute meditation. Now, some of you are like, Pete, you just said meditation. I'm not talking about, you know, the Asian thing where you're, right? Okay. But what I'm trying to say is this, is a two-minute meditation, a two-minute time period where you stop, pause, and get quiet. I have an Apple Watch, and several times throughout the day, it'll vibrate on my wrist, and I look at it, and what does it say? It says, breathe. And most of the time, I'm like, breathe? How do you think I got here? I'm still breathing, right? But every once in a while where I, I realize and God kind of hits the thing in my head, it kind of flips the switch, it's like, oh yeah, breathe. So I hit it, and I breathe. I exhale, I think about the day, I disconnect from the fast pace of life from all of the demands that are pulling at my attention. And I realize, you know what? I gotta, hey, God. What do you want to tell me today? What do you want me to recognize today that maybe I overlooked because I was going way too fast? How can I respond with gratitude? How can I respond with gratefulness? I love Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and it says this. What delight, listen to this, what delight comes to the one who follows God's ways? He won't walk in step with the wicked, nor share the sinner's way, nor be found sitting in the scorner's seat. His pleasure, and what? Passion is remaining true to the word of I am. Meditating on it day and day. And night, in the true revelation of light, he will be standing firm like a flourishing tree planted by God's what? Design. Deeply rooted by the brooks of bliss, bearing fruit in every season of life, he is never dry. How many of you are like me and you say, man, God, I wish there were times when I didn't feel like I was dry never fainting, ever blessed, and ever prosperous. Think about all that Jesus has done and, and what he says about you. Think about his faithfulness. Think about his promises to you, to me. God, you were so good. In all things, even in the things that I don't understand, God, may my response to what happens in my life be towards you. And the last one is this. Five gratitudes. List five things that you're thankful for. Because I want to tell you this. Whatever you magnify gets bigger. I want to focus in my heart on the right response. I want to focus in my life on what are the things that I'm truly grateful for. You know, Sarah and I, with our, our two kids, with Jaden and Blakely, we, we try to make it a priority when we, to, for the majority of the week, for dinner, we sit at the table, we eat together, we do all of these different things, but then, as we're sitting there, as we're eating, you know, we ask the kids, hey, what's something that you're thankful for today? What's something that you're grateful for? What were some of the good things that happened to you today? And some days it's kind of repetitive with what my kids say, but then some days, every once in a while, they'll drop a gem, and it was like, whoa, right? But there's something that happens when we begin to express with our very words gratitude. There's something that begins to happen when we begin to respond in a way that is not naturally the way we want to, but it's God's way. It's by God's design. See, he designed each and every single one of us to respond to him with worship. He designed each and every single one of us to respond to him with our praise, with our gratitude. And when we miss those moments, when we lose sight of those moments, we tend to magnify the other things that aren't God, and it ends up becoming more and more heavy, showing more and more problem. 
right? We, we begin to be more and more selfish. See, as we respond with gratitude, we can't help but be grateful. I believe that there are people in this room today. You're going through a tough time. You're walking with what feels like your greatest failure. And you're on the verge of giving up. Maybe some of you in this room, you would say, hey, Pete, you know what? My marriage is just not. It's shaky. Maybe some of you would say, you know what, Pete? My, uh, I feel alone. I feel isolated. I'm struggling with fear, anxiety. I just can't get a handle on stuff. I want to live this life of gratitude, of thankfulness, but it's so hard to even make my feelings follow. I want to tell some of you today, find help. Find help. Find a doctor. Go to counseling. Get in a small group. Whatever it is, talk it out. Don't allow yourself to isolate yourself. Because here's the other thing. We just heard these seven things, but I want to tell you what Paul's prescription is. Because here in Philippians chapter 4, this is what Paul is talking about. Paul is writing to the church in Philippi that is what? Suffering. He's writing to a people who are hurting. He's writing to a people who are full of pain, and they don't know where top is and where the bottom is. Everything is flipped upside down. Nothing is working right. They're trying to figure it out. And they're struggling. They're full of lack. They look at situations and circumstances and they feel like they're never enough or they don't have enough. And that their issues have issues. But Paul is writing a prescription to the church in Philippi. And he's not saying it's, it's not either or, but guess what? It's both and. It's all of it. See, I just gave you these seven steps. But I want you to take what Paul is saying as well. See, these seven steps that I read to you, they're from science, they're from research, they're from guys who have, who've got an education list and accomplishments that are way longer than mine. But I want you to understand something. When you start to look into some of it, when you start to research it, you start to realize that the research and science is actually catching up to what God's Word already says. See, Paul is writing to this church that is suffering. He's saying, rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. So I have a question for you, church. When should you rejoice in the Lord? How often? The Greek word for rejoice means panta. And when you look at it, it says always unceasing on every occasion I like Paul this guy is fiery he's his preacher you know and I feel like when I, if you read through this letter that he's writing in Philippians he's kind of getting his preach on you know I, I feel like he probably have a little gospel roots and be like yes sir right and he would start going all these different things ha you know start doing all that stuff and it's like he starts saying rejoice in the Lord always ha and again I say what Come on, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, see, happiness is a feeling. Happiness is an emotion. Happiness is fleeting. It's not permanent. It's temporary. God has something bigger and deeper for each and every single one of us that as we talk about living this life of thanks living, choosing to give thanks, You can't find gratitude on the surface. You can't find gratitude on the surface on the parts that have been charred, you, the parts that have been burned, the things that you may feel like are wasted. What happens? You might have to get a little sticky. You might have to get a little dirty. You might have to get to the center of it and realize, hey, there's something more. Something more. He says, enter his case with thanksgiving and praise. 
can't do either one of those things quietly. Both of those things can make you get loud. Both of those things kind of make you feel awkward. Right? But they make you celebrate. You can't be thankful with just the look on your face. The only way that you can be grateful is to speak out loud. Some of you today, you you have to cut the layer off of the problem. Remember that life is 10% of what happens and 90% of how you respond. So what if there's joy in there? What if there's fulfillment? What if there's purpose? What if there's something deeper that God has? So when you get promoted at work, when you find an answer to a problem, what do you do? Rejoice. For all the singles out there, when you found your special someone and you got married, you... Come on. What do you do when you finally get a breakthrough physically? You... Now you're getting it. What do you do when you finally get word of a child that you've been waiting to have for so long? What do you do when you realize, oh my goodness, I've been so fearful about my studies and my grades, and now i found out that things are actually going to work out, and I'm going to be able to pursue God in my education? You? When the doctor says that the cancer is not going to kill you? Come on. I need you to express this with your mouth today. Rejoice. When you finally get that car or that home that you've been saving for you. Paul says rejoice always. And again I say rejoice. Now here's the other thing. When you lose your job and you're struggling, what do you do? When you're not sure about what your kids are up to, you rejoice. When you don't have enough money to make the word end meet, right? You rejoice. Paul is writing a prescription that we bypass sometimes, but he's wanting us to program it and learn the right response. That I'm always going to rejoice. I'm always going to respond with gratitude. Why? Because there's a promise on the other side of rejoicing. See, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and thanksgiving. I'm getting ready to wrap up. And he says, present your request to God. And then he says, rejoice. And then with thanksgiving, tell him, God, I'm worried. God, I'm fearful. God, I don't know. I don't have understanding. I I can't tell you the answer to the problem. I'm bringing this to you. You begin to express it with your words. And then the promise that Paul says is that the peace of God, that's this church, that transcends all understanding. Well, what? It will guard your heart. I don't know about you, but I need God to guard my heart. Because if my heart gets tainted, I'm not who I'm supposed to be. See, the fact that God promises you peace, that when struggle comes, guess what? You're going to need to rejoice, and peace will always follow. You need to rejoice and respond with gratitude because then peace will always follow. You need to rejoice and then respond with gratitude. Why? Because peace will always follow. Your problem and your struggle and your situation may not make sense, but God's peace, which transcends all understanding, will go through all things to come about and do two things for you. That is to guard your heart and to guard your mind. When you respond with gratitude, you rejoice always. And again I say rejoice and God's peace will come. God's peace will come. Jesus has to be the source, church. He has to be the source. Would you stand to your feet today? I want to tell you today, church, this. That we have to respond 
If we want to live this life of faith, living, choosing to give thanks in all things, we must learn how to rejoice always. And again, I say, we must rejoice always. And again, I say, come on, every single person in this place, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to stretch your hands to the Lord right here in this moment. God, we have right now. God, that in every single person in this place, God, that in my heart and our prayer, that you would help us to look inside, just like you are some of us. Some of us in this place need to learn to 